Hey everyone, my name is Sifi. Uh, I think we can get started. I know there's a lot of really interesting sessions in this Empower B2B conference, so I want to make sure that um, and on time so that everyone can get to their next sessions uh, without running over. So um, thanks so much to everyone for joining. Hey Mark, uh, really appreciate the Empower B2B conference for hosting, hosting me today and excited to share a little bit about why a win-loss program is one of the most valuable forms of market feedback. Um, I've got a short presentation to share some of the best practices on why we've used this at our portfolio companies, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the Parker Gale portfolio. Um, but if you have any questions throughout, feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, I'll try to either answer it real time or we will uh, hopefully leave time at the end. So just to get started, um, so my name is Cece. I'm an operating principal at Parker Gale. Parker Gale is a lower middle market private equity firm. We're based in Chicago. We invest primarily in founder-owned B2B software companies. Um, most of our companies are, uh, on average, less than 30 million of revenues, um, can be up to around 100 employees on average. They're all B2B software, generally enterprise. And our thesis is that these companies have found their product market fit, but with a little bit of um, you know, operating help, which uh, I'm on the team on, we can help grow and scale them to the next level. So my role is to work specifically with our portfolio companies on their different go-to-market strategies. And as a result, I spend a lot of time with our product management, sales and marketing leaders, helping them grow their businesses as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Just a quick snapshot, we currently have nine companies in our portfolio. They're all over North America. Uh, they range from aviation software, legal tech software, uh, to um, horizontal businesses like master data management software, uh, supply chain compliance software. So um, excited to share some of the experiences that we've learned from working across these nine or 10 companies. Uh, and in particular, what I'll talk about today is a program that at Parker Gale, we roll out across all of our portfolio companies, which is um, one of the most important voice of customer programs, uh, and that's win-loss. So a little bit about why we decided to start win-loss programs in general at our portfolio companies. What would end up happening was we'd sit in board meetings and you know, inevitably sometimes a, a portfolio company would miss their, uh, miss their number. And we'd be asking the questions, well, you know, why, why did you miss the number? Or a lot of times they'd be saying, oh, well, this deal slipped and we'll get it next quarter. And it's just, it's, it's delayed. We haven't truly lost it. And we got back to thinking about, well, you know, why are the reasons that we truly win and what are the reasons that we truly lost? So sometimes when we ask about the reasons we lost, the head of sales would say that their sales rep told them, well, we lost based on feature. Or, oh, we lost because of price. Um, but then when we ask the flip side, well, why did we win that deal? It would be, well, it was a great sales rep. They, they built a good relationship and, and they conveyed the value. So we thought that in order to grow our companies at a quickly and scalable and efficient way. We wanted to have a more robust ongoing feedback program to capture some of the richest market data that you can get. And so we think a lot about voice of customer programs across our portfolio company. So we do net promoter scores um, and we have a program for that, but for win loss in particular is something that I've rolled out across, you know, almost all nine of our companies or are in the process of doing so. And so we do this in order to get some of the, as I mentioned, really rich competitive market intelligence, um, understand the purchase decision a little bit more, understand the purchase criteria. Uh, and there's a couple of benefits. But before I get into the benefits, just to really, I'm sure some of your companies have tried this, but for those who haven't, what is it exactly? A win-loss program is essentially a 30-minute call. Uh, usually done by someone who's not in sales, although sales plays a critical role, which I'll get to. And it's it's a program to try to understand why truly were, was one opportunity won and why was it lost. And the idea is to do this on a consistent basis so that you gather a lot of information over time. And once you have that, once you have that information over time, you can actually um, learn a lot from that and apply it and help improve your business so that we can get back to that more predictable and scalable growth. When we think about who benefits, as I mentioned in earlier, from a board level, we're constantly asking the questions, but I think the board and CEO can get the information from a win-loss call that helps them better understand market and competitive dynamics. 
um, help them inform strategic decisions, whether it's their product roadmap or um, prioritization, how they do resourcing, whether they want to do future acquisitions. There's a lot of different ways that this can inform strategic decisions at a board and CEO level. Sales is uh, one of the most important stakeholders of the information from win-loss. Obviously, the sales rep uh, and the sales leaders are in the deals and they're very close, but when they get the information from a third-party point of view, they often might get information that the prospect or customer might not have told sales directly because they didn't want to hurt their feelings or they don't want to be upsold. But win-loss can help the sales teams better understand the buying criteria and journey, again, get competitive information, and help them with their sales effectiveness. Customer success is another key stakeholder. They're often the ones that might conduct the win-loss calls, uh, in particular, the win calls. It'll help them better be set up for a smoother onboarding, help set accurate customer expectations if they knew exactly why they bought and what they were solving for. Um, and they might even identify some upsell opportunities. Marketing is another clear benefactor of information gained from win-loss. You can really understand which messaging or value proposition resonated with that customer or prospect? And more importantly, what resources and channels did they turn to when they were looking to evaluate this type of software or this type of product? And then last but not least, product uh, can definitely learn from what key selling features resonated the most, what were the missing capabilities, uh, and what are the things that you can prioritize on to help you with your product roadmap prioritization. And so just to clarify, when I talk about win-loss program, I see one of the questions is basically, I'm talking about the process where a company can set up a process to do win-loss calls after a call is won or lost. And I'll walk through the step-by-step -step of what that looks like. But what we're saying is, as an organization, how do you collect market feedback after a deal is won or after a deal is lost? And then the last thing I'll say is, we'll talk a little bit more in detail Sales will be the ones that are talking to the customers, but after it's marked as closed one or closed lost, we typically don't have sales be the ones that actually do the calls. We have marketing product or customer success are the ones because what you don't want is someone who was already part of the sales process. So it's much easier to go to a prospect that you lost and say, hey, I'm from product. We understand you went in a different direction, but we'd really love your feedback because we're always looking to improve. Would you mind speaking with us for 15 or 20 minutes so we can better understand what exactly um, we can do better going forward? So in terms of implementing it, there's a couple of basic steps. What I loved about trying, at least trying out win-loss is this is something that any company can start doing tomorrow. You don't need a software. You don't need a whole program. Obviously, if you want to do it on a consistent basis, you have to be able to really try to systematize this and and make things easier but this is something that from a crawl walk run any company can start crawling tomorrow and that starts with having a really good conversation with your sales team and your sales leaders and so when you are starting with it you're connecting with sales you're looking at the list of who to call and i'll talk a little bit about which ones are the best ones to call someone that's not in sales does step two which you're interviewing the accounts um, again, this can be someone in marketing, someone in product, someone in customer su success. If you're looking at the results, and then most importantly, you're disseminating those findings back to the organization, because the worst thing that could happen is if one function, let's say product, has all this win-loss data, and if they never share it back to the organization, how can the rest of the organization benefit? And then over the medium to long term, you might take changes or actions to, to fix things within your sales process, within your product, that, from this feedback that you get. For us, um, in terms of which ones to call, we kind of like to prioritize of, obviously, if you had a company that is, let's say, a new logo you're trying to win, and uh, you ended up making it decently far down the path, like not like just did one demo, not tire kickers, but if someone made it further along, call it like later stages of your sales process and spent some significant amount of time with you and your sales team, those would be the ones that maybe they're at a contract stage or a proposal stage that you would be trying to reach out to. New logo wins are obviously also a really great call to make. And those, in my opinion, should be uh, almost not optional. Every new customer that you onboard should, should be the first step of your onboarding process. But you can also do win-loss calls on customers 
um, that have churned or renewed, especially if they evaluate the market. So there's a lot of a lot of audiences that you can call within this program. We have within our Parker Yale portfolio companies, they might typically ask 15 to 20 questions in a 30 minute piece, but I'm going to share with you five of the questions that I think have resonated the most across our portfolio companies, um, regardless of what end industry they are, they are in. So the first one that we like to ask is, you know, what pain point were you trying to solve that led you to search for a new solution in the first place? We know that from some of our sales trainings that you know people buy because they're trying to solve a pain, they're scared of something, it's out of fear, or it might bring them pleasure. But the number one reason that they'll buy and the fastest reason they'll buy is to solve that pain point. Another way we look at that is from our portfolio companies, we often ask, are you selling a vitamin or a painkiller? Is it a nice to have or is it really fixing something that's causing a customer or prospect pain? So really being able to identify what pain point they were trying to solve and getting that information over time has been extremely helpful. Second one is, you know, what competitive competitive alternatives did you consider to solve this pain point? This could be the incumbent solution. This could be not a software solution at all. It could be Excel or Outlook or just someone doing it manually. But trying to understand that in a sale process, who are you really up against? And it might not be just the basic competitors that you think they are. The third question we frequently like to ask are, what are your top three key purchase criteria in selecting this type of software? This is not necessarily like, what are the top three reasons you selected me? But like in general, are you looking at feature functionality? Is it ease of use, customer support, price, something else? One of the most interesting things that we've seen is that a lot of times we hear from our sales reps that, oh, we lost because of price and it was too expensive. Um, but when you end up asking this one particular question over and over again, and you make the prospect or customer answer in, in this order, price rarely ends up being the number one purchase criteria. They're looking for a product that will actually solve their product, their, their pain points, and they're willing to pay you know, a good value for it, but they're not necessarily always looking for the lowest price solution. Another question we frequently like to ask is, you know, what did you see as a main value proposition of our company's solution? What every company has your marketing collateral, all the materials, your sales enablement, your battle cards, um, and you have the idea of what your own value proposition is. But if you actually were to ask your customers or prospect, like, what do you think is the base value proposition? You might be surprised at what they actually bought your solution for or what they were thinking was most important. And then finally, this is a great chance to get some feedback on the sales process. I want to be clear that we're not trying to dig up dirt on the sales team at all. That's that's not the point. But we're trying to understand where could we have done better? Where could we have? Uh, where did we do well that we should keep doing? So you could ask questions like on a one to scale of one to five, with five being very effective. How effective was our sales team at conveying our value proposition? And if they gave you a three, then you can say like, okay, well, what could they have done to do better? And this feedback will hopefully be most relevant when you go back to your sales team and say, you know, did you know that this really resonated the most with the prospects and we should emphasize that more. There's obviously a lot more questions you can ask in a win loss interview from a marketing perspective. For example, you can ask, you know, which channels did you turn to or what resources did you turn to to try to make your decision or how important was it talking to a reference customer, for example. Um, but these are all different examples of questions that can be asked. But for us, um, looking across all of our portfolio companies, these are the, the top five that have been most helpful. So at Parker Gale, we've rolled out win-loss programs over the past couple of years to um, the majority of our portfolio companies or are in the process of starting it with some of our new ones. And there's been a couple lessons learned after trying to roll out this program. I think the first one is, as I mentioned, with win-loss, it's crawl, walk, run. You can start it tomorrow. You can start today if you talk, find the, the most recent sales call that was uh, the most recent sale that was won or the most recent one that was lost. You can start this today. But if you want to do this on a consistent basis over time, getting a chance to automate it will help you a lot more. So you can automate a win-loss report in your CRM. For some of our companies, we get that on a weekly basis and the head of product gets a ping every Friday saying, here's the calls to make this week. Um, the second part is 
especially for wind calls, as I mentioned before, doing it as part of your customer onboarding process. The idea of doing a wind loss call is this should be done within two weeks, right after the deal is closed, marked as closed or lost. And the reason you don't want to do it too long is because this is not meant to gather feedback about your product. You don't want this company to have installed or implemented your solution. This is meant to capture their sentiments right at the heat of their buying decision. And so for a customer, um, if you're doing, if they have already signed on to be a customer, if you can make it as the first step of your customer onboarding process, and then you do your kickoff call where you get all the data and other stakeholders in the room, we find that super valuable. And so wind calls, in theory, depending on the volume of calls that you have, could be not optional. You could just make it and build it in. The third piece is, as I mentioned, sales is never the one that conducts the calls, but they're a critical part of this process. So you want to make sure there's a smooth and timely handoff from the sales team. And again, the feedback is that when you go to the sales team, this will be your best way to um, get feedback so that they continue on their future calls. Um, so they're the ones that hand it off, but they're the ones that should be the first to receive the information as well. Another point is just trying to make scheduling easy. Um, we find that the biggest burden of people doing win-loss calls, it ends up just being an administrative burden or they think it's important and they should get to it, but then they don't end up getting to it and then they haven't gotten as much information as they hoped. And then finally, um, again, depending on your industry, some of our industries are more sensitive than others, especially for the loss calls. We know that customers' times and prospect times are valuable. So if they decided to not work with you, um, we've seen some of our portfolio companies offer like a $50 gift card to say, hey, we understand you selected a different solution. We really value your time. We'd still love to get feedback and improve. You know, would you mind speaking to us for 20 minutes? Um, and here's a $50 gift card. And I think the other thing is in the lost call, sometimes you have to be a little bit persistent. Uh, it might take three or four touches. But the thing that actually has increased the lost calls the most for our portfolio companies has been doing it in a timely manner. Once it's closed loss or they've officially said no, they're moving on pretty quickly. So if you can still catch them within that first week, you're more likely to get a response. Um, I know for our portfolio companies, we've seen this roll out at eight or nine different companies. I'm happy to talk through some of these FAQs um, that I've frequently got, but I also wanna see if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to add them in the chat and I can also answer them now as part of this as well. But coming back to, when I think about the fundamentals of win-loss, I mentioned before, to try to get as many calls as possible, you try to conduct those within two weeks of the deal closing, um, especially so that it's fresh. When you think about who else should join from the company, um, as I mentioned, sales shouldn't be the ones that conduct the calls. And again, the reason is that the salesperson might not be, uh, the, the, the prospect might not answer as truthfully to the sales team because they've already developed a relationship with them. Um, but product or customer success or marketing are frequently the ones that are joining these calls. In some cases, this was pre-COVID days when we had people in the office, you would have people in the office, um, we'd have a head of product and we would invite the engineering teams to just sit in and listen in on this. Um, and that really brought it to life. So there's a way to listen in on these calls. Um, but again, we really discourage sales from being the ones that conduct the calls because you're trying to get an unbiased view and someone that doesn't know the customer that well during the buying journey. In terms of the uh, how long the call should go for, we start with like 30 minutes. You'd be surprised that, and maybe you know, some of these customers actually want to talk to you for a lot longer. So I always build in a buffer afterwards, but um, you know, 30 minutes is is kind of the standard starting point. Another question that I often get is, you know, how do we know which calls to make? Um, how do we prioritize between wins, losses, renewals, and turns? And so in my order of priority, I think the most valuable calls are number one, like new logo lost calls. Um, and again, these are lost calls that have made it far enough down uh, the funnel that they know your product well enough. It's not just they came to one webinar or uh, they came to one demo, but someone who's really evaluated and taken the time to get to know your business. If you can get those, those are also the hardest calls to get, but they're really valuable information. Not far behind that, though, is I think your new logo win 
calls. Um, a lot of people, a lot of our portfolio companies are trying to chase the one that got away. Why didn't we win this? Why, why didn't we win that call? Why did we lose that deal? But I actually think your win calls and the reasons that someone chose you are just as valuable because in those calls, you'll still get someone who really looked at the market, but then you'll know what to keep doing over and over again so you can have more of them. And so I think new logo win calls are the next most important, but also just as valuable calls to make. The third one would be, you know, customers that left you the same way you do an exit interview if a customer turns, trying to get some feedback on that as to understanding why. And then the final one would be um, a customer that renewed. So if you, they were in a three year contract and they renewed and you had a sense that they um, they might have tested the market or the, the, you're, you're in a very dynamic market where a lot of things are changing. It's always a good chance to get the feedback of like, well, why did you decide to renew with us and, and what was important or what can we keep doing? Another question that we often get is, you know, who should we be calling at the company? So especially in some of our enterprise sales, uh, there's multiple stakeholders that are involved during a sale process. And for us, our guidance would be try to speak to the primary decision maker. They might not be the end user in this case, but we're really trying to understand again, the customer buying process, their purchase criteria. And so they may bring some people to, to join that call, but if you can get to the decision maker versus just an end user, or at least whoever is the main champion, we find that those are the most important um, and valuable feedback. And then once they're a customer, you might always be able to get more user feedback on the product itself. But for win-loss calls, we try to talk to the main decision maker. Another question we get is like, who should receive the win-loss information that you get? Um, I think that win-loss information in the right format can be relevant to the entire company. As I mentioned at Parker Gale, we ask for these at board meetings on a quarterly basis. We wanna know how many calls did you make? What were the key themes that you learned? Why did you win? Why did you lose? What are the things and what are the actions that you're taking? But the sales team, as I mentioned, should be one of the biggest recipients, whether it's a monthly or quarterly basis. We have some of our, at one company, we have a product team that sits in on the sales meetings like once a month um, and they give them regular feedback and they have a discussion. Well, sales heard this, product heard this from the win-loss calls, like, you know, how do you marry that up and how do you keep on improving? But there's also areas to share them like company-wide, whether it's at a town hall or um, other employees, because at the end of the day, for, if you're a whole company had a better understanding of why your customers decided to buy your product, I think everyone would benefit no matter what function you're in. One other question that um, we get is, you know, can we use a third party firm? So there are third party firms out there that can do these win loss calls on your behalf. We've only tested that out once or so. Um, this kind of depends on how high your average selling price is and what kind of volume you're in. For most of the Parker Gale portfolio companies, we are only, you know, they're not closing hundreds of deals a quarter. It's in the dozens or less. And so it's an acceptable volume that they can do these calls in-house. And it's not even so much as to save money on the cost, but I think there's a ton of value in someone who knows your product being able to conduct the call or knows the companies because as much as you have a win-loss script, you might not be able to get the nuances and the follow-ups and some of these things. So there are third-party firms and you can definitely test it out, but right now, most of our companies are doing it in-house so that the information can stay within the company. Uh, and then finally, I often get asked like, well, can we send a survey instead of doing a call? And again, this comes back to your balance of do you have a high volume, you know, low average selling price or do you not have that many volume, high volume of new deals um, that you can manage it? Uh, there's a world in which you could, if you sell multiple, one of our companies has multiple product lines that are different price points and they might send out a survey to the lower price point ones and then try to get the more enterprise customers on the call uh, or on the phone. And then, you know, as a last resort, if you're doing a lost call and you followed up with this customer three or four times or this prospect, excuse me, three or four times, um, you may be able to also try to send them a survey, but I think most people know that there's also a ton of survey fatigue um, that happens. And so we find it more effective and more valuable to get the nuances when you're able to do a phone call. So 
Um, those were some of the key FAQs that we often get about starting a win loss program. I'm happy to see if anyone has any questions about starting a voice of customer program, whether it's win loss or something else at their portfolio companies, or sorry, at your companies. Um, and I'm trying to look through the chat to see if there's anything else. There you go. Yeah, I'm just looking at David's comment. There's the key purchase criteria is one of my favorite questions and one of the most valuable things where we think that a company bought on price, but they really bought because of something else, for example. So Tiffany, I agree. A survey with an incentive, if it's a final touch, um, that might be a chance to get them to, you know, you might have offered them a $50 gift card to talk to you on the phone. Maybe it's a five or $10 gift card to fill out a quick survey, but no matter what, I think it's, it's worth the effort um, because I know our companies have learned so much from it. So um, awesome. Well, if anyone's interested in learning more, um, I'm always happy to uh, share more about what we've learned across our portfolio companies. I've included my LinkedIn and my email. Parker Gale uh, actually also has a podcast where we talk about all things private equity, um, both from operating companies. So we talk about win loss, net promoter score, how we think about talent. Uh, and we also talk about how we think about in investing and some of the thesis that we make and board meetings and um, looking at new deals and things like that. So um, let's see, Lydia, where do you recommend documenting the changing definition of metrics for success? That's a good question, Lydia. So the question is, where do you recommend documenting the changing metrics for success? Um, in general, from a documentation standpoint, we keep all these win-loss calls. We recommend you keep all these win-loss calls in your CRM so that this is like a single source of record. And um, when you think about um, you know, the reasons why you won and lost themes, you might have quarter, again, for us, it's at a board level, quarterly themes. Um, you know, how many times you, someone had said, for example, we did 20 win loss calls and on the key purchase criteria, ease of use came up 12 out of 20 times. These are the types of metrics that we would kind of track over time since you're asking the same question. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question, Lydia, but. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that might, might answer that a little bit. Um, in terms of other documenting, uh, changing definition or metrics for success, aside from documenting the CRM, the common themes, um, I think it's the win loss report really has to make sure that you're showing that consistent themes over time. And so for example, if you can keep seeing like, you know, we lose, if you build a rich enough database of information, you can start to see themes of like, we lose to competitor A 80% of the time, especially when they had this kind of purchase criteria. So hopefully this information will help you actually um, better qualify and know where to spend your time on um, versus, you know, wasting your time on some a deal that you probably shouldn't have been in in the first place. So yeah, customer success could capture this data over time to see themes. Um, as I mentioned, product management is frequently the owner of this program because a lot of the feedback might be product oriented. But again, whether it's customer success or marketing or product that owns it, we really encourage you to share it around with the other functions and especially back to sales. Any other questions from this group? All right, well, I hope this is a helpful starting point depending on where you are, whether you've started win loss or um, you are already really experienced in it. And uh, if you have any questions, you know how to reach out. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their conference.